Hello, welcome to our second Women Fellowship. My name is Lynn Boom. I'm from IBC Cologne, and I thank you for joining us as we walk through God's plan, God's mercy and grace, and His faithfulness in the light of Sarah's and Hagar's life. The main point of the podcast teaching is to look at God's plan despite failures and shortcomings. I invite you, while listening to a narrative summary of Sarah's journey, to look at God's plan. God's protection of his plan is beyond failures, shortcoming, and time. The first record of Sarah is in Genesis chapter 11, verse 29 and 30. And it tells us she was Abraham's wife, was barren, and had no child. Her journey begins with her father-in-law, Terah, as they went forth from Ur of Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. They then settled in Haran, a major metropolis at that time. After this, Sarah came with her husband and uh, her husband Abraham to the land of Canaan and then went down to Egypt, fleeing the famine in Canaan. There, Abraham put Sarah in a vulnerable and compromising position, asking her to say she is his sister. Because of Sarah, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 17. As God called out Abraham and with him Sarah from their country, he promised to make of him a great nation. But years went, and Sarah had no child. Not only did God reiterate his promise in Genesis 15, but he made a covenant with Abraham, promising to give the land to Abraham's offspring. Now, Sarah had borne Abraham no children. Impatient, probably desiring to control the situation, and most probably with the best intention to help God, Sarah gave her servant Hagar to her husband so that she obtains children by her. Sarah followed a practice which was common those days and ignored the promise of God. After 10 years living in Canaan, waiting for an offspring and year to be born, Sarah went ahead of God and not only Was she not taking the responsibility for her failure, but she blamed her husband for the situation? Now, the Hebrew parable is done. Sarah has messed up, but the Lord still promised to bless her. Years after, not only is God promising to give Sarah a son, but he promises to establish his covenant with the son she will bear as we read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 21. The promise of Isaac's birth in a time according to God's timetable opposed to Sarah's age then made her laugh. She laughed within herself and denied it, but God knew the doubt within her and answered asking, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Although these words could have comforted Sarah's heart over the time and years, yet in Genesis 20, she is once again in a situation of adultery. God's handprint is repeatedly undeniable. He appeared to Abimelech in a dream, speaking of him as a dead man because he took Sarah. God himself did prevent Abimelech to touch Sarah. Now, I want to conclude saying God, in his sovereignty, chose Sarah, a barren woman with no child to bear Isaac, an ancestor of Jesus. Driven by fear, impatience, and doubt over the time, Sarah took action that could have changed the plan, but amidst the failures, adultery, and lies, God protected and fulfilled his promise. 
After the transgression of Adam and Eve in the garden, God's plan to save and redeem humankind through the atonement of Jesus Christ in order to restore the fellowship with him is unfold through the life of the people he has called and through time. From uprooted from her country to becoming nations, as the Lord said for Sarah in Genesis 17, verse 16, Sarah was vulnerable, probably felt lonely, not having a fellow compatriot. She was most likely desperate and possibly jealous or envious of Hagar. She deviated, but God's plan prevailed. We see God's handprint in the story of Sarah. God's plan in the days of Sarah to save and redeem us, molding and sanctifying us to the restoration of fellowship with him through Jesus is the same today. Now, looking at my own life and regards Sarah's story, I will say in this season of my life, sometimes overwhelmed with emotions, not sure where my home is, I navigate through difficulties, being confident that he who began a good work in me will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In regards of Sarah's life, and encouraged by First Peter in chapter 1, from verse 3 to verse 5, I see that the plan of God to save me and give me a hope that is beyond here and now transcends with all my weaknesses and failure. It's not always easy. But, Looking at Sarah's life, I'm encouraged to walk by faith and not by sight. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. And now I want to give you some questions to reflect on. What does the life of Sarah teach you in your personal life? Take time to look at the whole story of God's plan to restore us from sin. Could you see yourself in it? Do you discern God's will in the current stage of your journey? What are you doing to help God? Are you doing anything at all like Sarah to help him? Are you seeking to gratify your own desire and set aside his commandment? I hope this has encouraged you or at least gives you, it gives you the desire to continue walking by faith. Thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to our second Women's Fellowship. I am Bianca Zuniga from IBC Bonn, and I'm excited that you joined us today as we walk through, literally, through Sarah and Hagar's lives and see God's plan, God's mercy and grace, and God's faithfulness permeate their stories. Specifically in this podcast, we will see how God's mercy and grace towards Hagar is seen through his tender care of her and Ishmael. We will take a closer look and see how Hagar's story fits into Abraham and Sarah's story. Specifically, we will trace how God reveals his mercy and grace to Hagar by caring for her in her affliction in a personal and unmerited way. And we will see how Hagar can't help but to respond in worship and obedience. This little side note here, the scripture that I reference will be in your booklet and as well as the memory verse of Genesis 16 verse 13. Um, Now let's get started. Before we trace God's mercy and grace in Hagar's life, let's take a quick look um, of her life. In Genesis 16, we learn that she is Sarah's Egyptian slave. We also learn that she is given to Abraham as a wife because Sarah and Abraham grow a little impatient waiting for God to fulfill his promise in giving them a child. 
Sarah and Abraham follow a common ancient Near Eastern practice to raise an heir. Hagar conceives, and then this brings tension between Sarah and Hagar, or as the Bible says, Hagar looked with contempt at her mistress. This tension occurred because Hagar's child could be considered Sarah's son and thus the heir. So think of it as surrogate motherhood. Therefore, the tension lies in the question, whose child will it be? Frustrated, Sarah approaches Abraham and neither of them take responsibility for their sin. And Abraham gives Sarah permission to handle the situation as she sees fit. Sarah then mistreats Hagar. We don't know the extent of this mistreatment as the Bible doesn't explicitly say how Sarah mistreated Hagar, but we do know two things. First, the same Hebrew word is used to describe the nation of Israel's oppression by Egypt in Genesis chapter 15 verse 13 and in Exodus chapter 1 verses 11 through 12. Second, we know that it was severe enough for Hagar to flee. Hagar flees from Sarah and is alone and pregnant, wandering in the wilderness. She's experiencing firsthand the brokenness of sin. Here, God intervenes, and it is here where we pick up her story. First, we will take a look at how God's tender care of Hagar is personal. God intimately knows Hagar and her circumstances. After finding Hagar in the wilderness, fleeing towards Egypt, God approaches her with a question— In Genesis 16, verse 8, he says, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? So why is this so extraordinary? Let's look at his question a little closer. In this verse, we see that God calls her by name. He knows who her master is, and in short, he knows who she is. God is omniscient, or all-knowing, and therefore knows exactly what Hagar's circumstances are. Yet, he chooses to approach her with a question and engage her. Through this interaction with Hagar, we learn that God is an all-knowing and personal God. God also appears and reveals himself to Hagar in the wilderness as she is fleeing from Sarah. God personally appeared to Hagar, and we see this in Genesis 16, verse 7, as it reads, The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. This verse is the first of several references to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. There's always a debate in these references as to whether this is an angel or God himself. And each time this phrase appears in scripture, it should be examined carefully to determine whether it is referring to God or to an angel. In this context, however, we know that this phrase is referring to God himself. Specifically, it's referring to Jesus. We know that by Hagar's worshipful response in Genesis 16 verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here, I have seen him who looks after me. Some Bible translations um, have this phrase as, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? God personally appeared to Hagar and she wasn't consumed. Hagar had knowledge of who God was because she had lived with Sarah and Abraham, but now she had a personal encounter with him. God also reveals his character to Hagar when he reveals himself as the God who hears and sees her affliction. After God finds Hagar in Genesis sixteen eleven, he commands her to name her child Ishmael, which means God hears. This name is to be a permanent witness to Hagar that God hears her affliction and will continue to do so in the future. We see other examples of God hearing the affliction of his people in the Bible. For instance, we see how God heard Israel's cry hundreds of years later when Israel was in Egyptian slavery. You can look at this closer in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, and chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. We learn that God sees when when we look at Hagar, how Hagar responds in worship in Genesis 16, verses 13 and 14. After her encounter with God, Hagar gives God a name. You are a God of seeing. She then goes on to name a well in remembrance of her encounter with God. Here in scripture, God has revealed himself to be a God who hears and sees us in our affliction. So far, we have seen how God's care of Hagar was personal and intimate. Now we will see how his care of her was completely unmerited. Throughout scripture, we learn that God's intention was always to pass his covenant blessing on through Isaac, the child of promise. This is explicitly stated in Genesis chapter 15 and in Genesis chapter 17. And the apostle Paul further solidifies that in Galatians chapter 4. 
However, due to Sarah and Abraham's disobedience, Hagar and Ishmael become a part of the narrative, and there was constant tension between Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. We see this in Ishmael's mocking of Isaac in Genesis 21, when Isaac is weaned and Abraham celebrates with a feast. Ultimately, Hagar and Ishmael had to be sent away in order for God's covenant with Abraham Abraham to be fulfilled. However, in his infinite wisdom, God designs a plan to both uphold his promise to Abraham and Sarah while still providing for Hagar and Ishmael. In Genesis 16, verses 11 and 12, God promised Hagar that he will multiply her offspring and make Ishmael into a great nation. Later, we see God confirming this with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And once again, God reassures Hagar of this promise when she and her son are sent away in Genesis 21. Ultimately, we see his promise fulfilled at Abraham's death in Genesis 25. God didn't need to provide for Hagar and Ishmael, but God mercifully takes Hagar and makes her into a matriarch and Ishmael into a nation. We've seen how God's mercy and grace can be seen in his personal and unmerited care for Hagar and Ishmael, and now we'll focus on Hagar's response. After encountering God and seeing his mercy and grace through his care of her, Hagar responds in worship and obedience. He, she obeys God's command to return and submit to Hagar or to Sarah. It's worth noting that she is no, has no promise that her treatment would be better, but she obeys because she had just learned that God sees and hears her no matter the affliction she may encounter. Furthermore, she knows that she has promised that he has promised her blessing and Ishmael blessing. Later, when Hagar and Ishmael are sent away in Genesis 21, God calls out to Hagar, reminds her of his promise, and provides a wealth for her in Ishmael. She responds in faith and obedience and lives in the wilderness with her son. We see God fulfill his promise to them in chapter 25, where we learn that Ishmael has 12 sons that later become 12 tribes. So we've seen how God's mercy and grace can be traced through his tender care of Hagar and Ishmael. We see how his care for them was personal and unmerited. We saw how Hagar responded to God's tender care in worship and obedience. I encourage you to take this example in scripture and respond in worship and obedience whenever you encounter suffering. We are free to respond in this way because as we just learned, God is a God who sees and hears us in our affliction and intimately walks with us in suffering. I'd like to leave you with an example of how I've seen God's tender care in my own seasons of suffering. During an intense season of my life, God provided the encouragement I needed to continue in obedience, even when suffering endured. My senior year of college was an intense season for me. I went through a bad breakup, and my parents were going through financial hardship. I was so consumed with anxiety and grief about these two things that one day I completely forgot about an exam I had the next day. I remember trying to push my emotions aside and focus on studying, the one thing I could control, right? However, I quickly learned that I couldn't bring myself to focus on studying for the exam. I left the library and sat in my car in the parking lot and cried. I remember saying, God, I know you are good and in control even now, but my faith is weak and I just need to know that you even care. I said that and seconds later, I hear a knock at my window and this girl asked if I was all right and if she could come in and sit with me. I had never met her before, but I let her in and explained everything that was happening. To my surprise, she was a Christian, and she listened and prayed with me. She reminded me that God cared for me even though my circumstances were challenging. It was only after we prayed that I found out that she was discipling my best friend. So God knew exactly what and who I needed in that moment. My problems weren't solved the next morning. My parents' financial situation wasn't resolved, and I was still in an emotional turmoil after my breakup. And I was unprepared for my exam. The first two situations would continue for several more months and the rest of my school year would be marked by distraction. However, the night, that night God demonstrated that he was with me during my suffering. After that night, I could see God's grace and mercy towards me amid my suffering more clearly. For instance, he had surrounded me with dear friends who kindly reminded me to keep my eyes on Jesus. These friends and I were all roommates and we were all going through a season of suffering on our own. And we all were Christians. I look back at that moment in my life with such sweetness because I can easily see how we encouraged each other as suffering continued. And we were able to rejoice with each other when we were on the other side of suffering. I look back at this season of my life and see how God taught me to suffer well. 
just as 1 Peter 5, 19 says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. It's my prayer that we can all learn to run to our faithful creator and trust him as we walk through suffering. I hope that taking a look at Hagar's story has encouraged and blessed you today. Take a moment to answer these reflection questions with a few other women and together trace God's mercy and grace in your own suffering. Think of a time when you encountered suffering and felt like Hagar. Then answer the following questions. Question number one, what was your initial reaction to your suffering? What were your initial thoughts? Question number two, as we've seen today, God is a God who sees and hears. And this doesn't change when we encounter suffering. He sees and hears us and willingly willingly meets us in our suffering. How did you experience this, this care during this period? When you encountered suffering, how are you blinded to God's care? And how can you refocus your eyes on Jesus during your suffering? Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you enjoy the rest of our time together. Hi, I'm Beth Campbell from IBC Bonn. Thank you for joining me in our part two lesson on Sarah and the final segment in our Sarah walk journey. In our final look at Sarah, this podcast teaching focus will be on God's faithfulness and how he magnifies this character through Sarah's life as well as my own. Now to help us through our final teaching, I'll be focusing on God's faithfulness in three key points. God's faithfulness is one, in his time, two, through his people, and three, for his glory. Just as a side note, I'll be reading various scripture throughout the podcast, and you can find the references in your booklet or on the screen uh, in order of recitation. So let's dig into Sarah's life through these three key points. Number one, God's faithfulness is in his time. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did not <laughs> did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. God's timing does not look like our time. It is not restricted to creation or natural order or personal choice. It is divine and kingdom-minded, purposeful for God's plans and glory. Sarah was 66 when they left her on, barren and only just received God's promise for a child. She's 77 when Ishmael is born. That's about 10 years of waiting and questioning before she begins to help God with his plans. Can you imagine the lies Satan must have whispered into her heart as she waited? She's 91 when Isaac is born, 25 years after God first promises to bless him and give him land and a child. They never inherit the land in their lifetime, and even then it's more than 400 years before their descendants can occupy it. Gosh, what a life of waiting. I found this timeline very helpful as I examined Sarah's life. I don't always know why some lives are filled with challenges while others seem blessed. But I can look at Sarah's life and see God in the midst of her challenges and watch her transformation into the woman that glorifies God in a more beautiful way than the woman that seems to have an easier life. Trials shape our character refine our hearts, and teach us new truths about the Lord. Seasons of waiting are a vulnerable time in our walk with the Lord, as we'll continue to see in Sarah. So I encourage you in seasons of waiting to guard yourself with God's word, remind yourself of God's promises, and lean into a trustworthy woman to walk with through the seasons of vulnerability. As James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Number two, God's faithfulness 
is through his people. Sarah was a sinner. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Sin has corrupted all of mankind, and even God's chosen people cannot escape the temptation of turning away from God, nor the consequences that follow. Living out our plans, even when it's pursuing good things, will leave us broken in our sin. Sarah is pursuing God's plan, but in her own way, which leaves her devastated by the results. We know this because of the way her sin manifested itself in her. Galatians helps us identify her works of the flesh when it says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, divisions, and envy. When we experience deep hurt, we need to cry to God for help, examine our heart with the Lord, be filled with his fruit, Put on his armor and then approach the person involved in our pain. Let us also be reminded of the truth written in James. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Despite her failures, though, isn't it amazing that Sarah is our example of a faithful follower? And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did this thing? Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, He is my brother. First Peter points to this story and declares her to be a character worth following. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. She is worthy of example by the way she submits, by the way she does good, and by the way she stands without fear to that which is frightening. Sarah is a woman who hopes in God. This is faith, faith that enables her to conceive in God's timing and according to his plan. Faith that does not fear man's power over her situation in life or body, but rather trusts in God's protection, provision, and purpose. God promises in Romans 8.28 that for those who love him, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Being a willing follower is crucial to this blessing. Sarah was willing to go, to be used, to be shaped. Secondly, God equips those he's called. Sarah is refined throughout her life to have a heart that will glorify God all the more through his faithfulness in her journey. And thirdly, our sinful pasts do not prevent God from using us for his glory. God chose Sarah and was faithful to do his work in her. 
as Christ's followers, he's chosen us. And he will be faithful to do his work in us too. Lastly, number three, God's faithfulness is for his glory. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. God gives Sarah a name, an identity, a call, and a lineage She has been set aside for his purposes. She is a source for nations and kings. God receives glory by doing things no one else can do and from people singing his praises. God's faithfulness to Sarah produced joy, laughter, and worship in her. Isaac was a visible testimony to Sarah about God's promise-keeping character Generations were already waiting for the promised Savior, and God was faithfully unfolding his plan through Sarah to redeem all people. There's a song we'll sing together shortly called Promises. It is a response of worship to God's faithfulness. When we sing together, I encourage you to remember God's faithfulness in your life. Respond to God about his faithfulness to Sarah. Respond to God about his faithfulness to you. So as I close this teaching segment, let me recap and share a few thoughts. God spoke to Abraham several times throughout this journey of promise by reassuring, affirming, and expanding on his plan. God recognizes our frailty for patience, lack of wisdom, and the enemy's habit of casting doubt. So within his time, through his people, and for his glory, he spoke. He reminded, he unfolded more of his plan. He restored their hope, affirmed their purpose, and revealed his glory, giving Sarah pillars of remembrance to cling to as she journeyed through life. God has laid out many promises for his people throughout scripture, and they're worth having hope in. We can trust in his love and faithfulness even when it takes 25 years and even when we don't receive the promise in this lifetime. Psalm 126.5 has been a promise I've clung to in my life. It says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Now, I believe God's promise to grant me shouts of joy will not be fully complete until the return of Christ. But there have been several pillars of remembrance I've built that reveal God's faithfulness to grant this desire and fulfill this promise. I can remember the very moment several weeks into praying this verse that I felt the Holy Spirit come into my life and the longing I felt for that joy began to take root. Six months after beginning this promise prayer, I met Stephen, and the Lord began to use him to bring healing to my life. Five years after, I meet a girl and learn about friendship. It had been nine years since I allowed myself a female friend. Eight years later, I received freedom from certain dreams and sin patterns. Ten years after, God reveals his love for me and finally grants me a deep love for Stephen. These are my pillars to remember God's faithfulness to restore my joy, to sanctify and make me new and make me whole again. God is faithful when I am not. His way is hard. It costs my time, my plans, and my hopes in order to follow him and trust in his promises. I'm thankful for his revealed character in Sarah's life and in my own. Has God revealed his faithfulness to you? Do you know any promises of God? If so, what are some? 
Pray them over yourself and others. Today we focused on God's faithfulness in his time, through his people, and for his glory. As you leave today, explore with the Lord how your life is bringing him glory through his faithfulness. Think of his promises and your pillars. I hope this lesson has blessed you and encouraged you in your walk with the Lord. And as a reminder, if you are in a season of waiting, find a woman to walk with. It's a vulnerable time with the enemy, and the Holy Spirit and others can spur us on in the journey.